Okay, so we do have a question or two that came in. And uh, this one is coming directly from Dan. And Dan says, it would be great if you could show how to select good candidates for the poor man's covered call. Okay, Dan, that's an excellent question. I'm going to do something first. Let me just jot this down. Poor man's covered call. Okay. So the first thing I want to show you, Dan, is I'm going to navigate over to the free webinar section. This is a public page, powerop.com slash webinars.asp. I'm going to send that link to everyone in the chat there. And of course, powerop.com slash webinars.asp for those of you who are watching the recording later on. And Dan, I'm just going here because I want you to click on the Option Strategies tab. There's a variety of different presentations here. And I think we're going to go back to the beginning of 2019, if memory serves correct. Well, maybe it's older than that. There we go. And it was older than that. From March 15th, 2017, we sort of did a double presentation here. We did a calendar spread basics. That was just discussing the horizontals versus diagonals. And then the calendar spread criteria. We will recover the underlying stock criteria for diagonal and horizontal spreads, criteria set up for the proper structure in weekly or monthly diagonal spreads. The reason I'm showing you that, Dan, is I don't know if I'm going to have be able to go through the full discussion today as we only have an hour for the total presentation. I'll be more than happy. We're going to go over it. Don't get me wrong. But later on this weekend, if you have the time, go to the webinars page, scroll down to 3-15-2017, and check out calendar spread criteria for more in-depth discussion on what we're going to have right now. All right, now up at the top of my screen, I have some of the various strategies set up, but I don't have calendar call. That's the poor man's covered call, okay, diagonal spread. So, oops, sorry, I'm going to go to other strategies here on power options. Let's take out short collar, and I'm going to go ahead and add in calendar call to our menu and save the configuration. Okay, so now we have calendar call available as one of our tabs, and I'm just going to go into the main screen. Now, let me go back a step. For those that are brand new, covered call, of course. What are we talking about with a covered call? We buy stock, and then we're going to sell an at or out of the money call for planning on holding that stock long term to give us some appreciation. We're going to generate some income, maybe hope that that call expires worthless, and we can continue to just collect a dividend-like income week by week or month by month against our underlying stock shares to lower the cost basis, get better protection. Now. A lot of people might not be able to do a covered call, myself included, on something, let's say, such as, uh, what was the stock I was looking at the other day? Um, there was a stock, Sherwin-Williams, was around $570 per share, $580 per share, Amazon. So how can we play a nice bullish structure and generate premium on those types of securities? Well, we can do a diagonal spread where we're going to buy an in-the-money option. That's perhaps six. 10, 12 months, maybe 24 months out in time, depending on what's available. And then we're still going to sell the near-term call against it week by week or month by month to lower the cost basis of that long call with a higher delta that we're trying to use to mimic shares of stock without paying the full price. Now, good candidates for a poor man's covered call. Well, let's think about the objective for a moment. As you know, we can structure a covered call multiple ways. Let's say that we have a stock simply trading at $100 per share. And I say, okay, I like this stock. I think it's relatively bullish. I'm going to buy the stock at 100 and maybe sell the 100 call for, let's say, $3. So I take in $3 worth of premium. The stock goes above 100. We get assigned, if we don't roll or adjust it, we deliver our shares of stock at 100, and we make a 3% return on the investment. If I wanted a safer position, I wasn't married to the stock, I don't want to own it long term, I may buy that same stock, but sell the covered call at, say, 95, and collect maybe 750, maybe 
I'm sorry, maybe seven dollars. Let's just call it seven. Now, I'm five points below the stock price, but I collected seven dollars in premium, so the max return is going to be two dollars or two percent. And my goal is to have the stock stay above ninety-five, get assigned, make that two percent return for twenty or thirty days, and move into a new position. Why did I sell the in the money for a lower premium? Because now the stock can stay the same, move down slightly, or move up, and I still make the 2%. In this case, you still collected the 3% if the stock drops to 97, but now you own the stock, you can sell the call again. If this $100 stock is a core holding in my account, pays a high dividend, and I want to hold it long term, I don't want to sell the 95 and have to roll it. I may be wary about selling the 100, especially if I'm bullish. I might buy the stock at 100 and simply sell the 105. And maybe only collect a dollar or dollar fifty in this case. My goal is that the stock wouldn't reach 105. I wouldn't have to manage the call, buy it back, or adjust it. I'd make a 1.5 percent premium on the $100 stock, and I continue to try to write that month by month or week by week to lower the cost basis over time. I bring this up simply for two reasons. Number one. And related to Dan's question about a good candidate for a covered call, is there anything different or special that you would want to consider about the underlying stock criteria that it'd be different when considering a covered call or maybe an out-of-the-money, cash-secured, naked-put position? My thought is no. I still want to look for the same exact criteria I would look for a covered call, a naked put, or a stock that I'd want to own long-term. The same underlying stock right here. I want a stock that's in a good trend, has maybe good earnings performance, um, good volume, uh, good market cap, things of that nature. I'm looking for a good, stable, neutral to bullish stock. Now, that's just for the underlying. And in relation to the diagonal spread, you may not want to get assigned. You don't want to necessarily be selling the at the money, even though it gives you the best premium in the near term. That is the highest time value always occurs at the money. And I probably don't want to be in the money because unlike a covered call, on the diagonal spread, when the stock moves up, the profit tails off. You give back because of the delta ratio. And we're going to talk about that in a moment as well. So in relation to that, the two main factors are I want stocks that are neutral to bullish, the same thing I'd look for in a covered call, probably a married put, a bull put credit spread, or a naked put. For the options, I want the option that I'm buying to be far out in time, in the money, and probably with a high delta. And the call that I'm selling, I want it to be slightly out of the money where it still gives me a good premium against the cost basis of that leveraged long call. Pretty simple, but now it gets complex when we discuss the terminology that's involved uh, and other things as well. So let's go right into the search for our calendar call spread. So I'll just click on search. And when you go into the search in any of the strategies from Power Options, ignore that up top, You'll see some results that come up. Now, this is one of my saved searches from my accounts. What you would likely see is one of the defaults listed here. Calendar leaps number one. Uh, initial values is probably the one you'd first see. Uh, and then there's some weekly ones that are also available. Same strike spreads. Those are the horizontals. Dan, don't touch those yet. That's a different strategy and not one I'm a fan of. Let's just start with initial values. And this is a default criteria set that we've put together for you to find positions that match criteria that we think are relatively good. But you might want to change some of these based on your personal goals and your safety level, your risk threshold, I should say. The first one here, Designer Brands DBI, $16 stock. I might look for something a little bit more expensive. That's one of the advantages of using the quote-unquote poor man's covered call. I can trade a $700,000, $800,000 stock with maybe only paying $60, $70, or $80 per contract for the leap option or the long-term call. But in this case, we're looking at selling the January 42 days out in time, 
it's just looking at the next full available expiration, 20 strike call that's out of the money. Why? To give us a little bit of room. But we're going to buy a 2021, 400 days out in time, January 12 and a half strike. Almost 25% in the money, right? It's $4 in the money, about 25% in the money from 1663 for 550. Now it shows us our downside protection. What does this mean? 5.5%. Well, this is the premium 30 cents against the price we pay for the long, 550. So we're receiving 5.5% against it. And we roughly have, in this case, about 10 write cycles, meaning we could write this option 10 times over the course of four or six days if we write every 42 days. Okay. Now, right away, we already saw two things that might not meet our needs. If I only have 10 write cycles and on average I'm collecting 30 cents, well, that would only give me 330. That doesn't pay for the long option. That is true. But a simple example here is to see that I could probably sell the 17 and a half and get maybe 70 cents or 80 cents, and that would more than pay for the long option ask. So I want to be out of the money, but maybe not too far out of the money in this example for the near-term short option. You might also want to be shorter term, Dan, rather than looking at the next full expiration cycle that is 42 days out in time. Okay, so that's one thing we consider as well. Now, to make the changes, we're simply going to scroll down below the listed trades. Now here we can set our short expiration time frame. I'm going to curb this a little bit, Dan. We're going to drop this down to 0 to 30 days. Or I could just choose to look at standard expiration for December, which is only 14 days away, and then consider writing again for January, February, March, and April. You could look at all leaps if you wanted to. I'm just going to leave it at this 250 to 650 days out in time. Two important factors here. We saw the net credit, the net debit. Hey, this is what you'd pay, the difference between the two. Depending on what types of stocks you're looking at, you might want to adjust this. I had mentioned Amazon. Now, they're going to have some high cost for the in-the-money options, but they're also going to have high premiums for the ones that you're selling. However, those premiums might be greater than $15. So let's just up this. We're going to change it to look for a net credit. This is a debit, but we're going to look greater than negative 30. And I am going to put that downside protection up to five. Now, I am going to leave this here, forcing the short out of the money call to be at least at or out of the money. If you want it to be more out of the money, for the near-term call, I can use the percent out of the money, say greater than 2%, greater than 3%, allowing more room for growth on the position. And we want to be at least 5% in the money or so on that deep option. Now, this is more in the face of using a diagonal spread. This delta I'm looking at is more in a relation of using a diagonal spread as a near-term strategy to maybe buy five or six months out of time and sell a near-term, slightly out of the money call against it and hoping more for the appreciation and maybe getting out of the position in 60 days. My understanding is that some of the investors out there, some of the uh, options coaches out there that teach this quote unquote poor man's covered call are looking for a higher delta on the long and they're going further out in time. So we might look for a delta ratio of say greater than 0.8 for the long option. We want to be deeper in the money, higher delta so it moves more than one to one with the stock. Now what does that mean? It means it's going to have a higher cost, may result in higher debits as well, but we already took care of that you may need to lower this delta ratio down just a little bit, say to 1.7, okay, instead of greater than 2. That's the difference between the long option and the short option delta. So if I'm forcing the long option delta to be 0.8 or 0.9, that means the short option delta if I'm using a delta ratio of greater than 2, right? But that short option delta would have to be greater than 0.4 or 0.45 which by definition means you're right at the money. We want to be a little bit out of the money if possible, so I'm going to lower this delta ratio so we can stay in that 0 0.4, 0 0.3 range. Be a little bit out of the money. This is a filter kind of unique to power options. 
called the debit to strike difference ratio. And I always want this to be less than one, Dan, no matter what type of calendar spread, well, what kind of diagonal spread I'm doing when they're different strikes. What this means is that the total net debit I'm paying into the position, let's say my debit is $10, has to be less than the difference in strike prices. I'm going to explain that when we look at a profit and loss chart in just a moment. Okay? But it's very important to have this debit to strike difference ratio of less than 1. Now you can limit the bid-ask spread, so I'm not looking at things that have too wide bid-ask spread. You can put in your required volume or open interest for the two options, that's perfectly fine. And now we'll get into some technicals. And what I want here, I want the same things I'd look for on a stock. I'm not going to worry about volatility. And I'm not going to worry about the implied volatility ratio of the, the two options. I'm worried about the delta ratio, not the IV ratio. I may put in an average stock volume of greater than 750, greater than 750,000 shares traded per day. I'm likely going to look for a stock, I'm sorry, I'm likely going to look for a stock that's currently trading above its 20-day or 50-day moving average, a stock that's in an uptrend. I may even look for MACDs where the MACD line is above the signal line by at least one or two days to show a positive trend. Not necessary, but again, the same types of criteria you'd look for for just buying a stock or doing a standard covered call or cash secured naked put. Fundamentals, yeah, reasonable earnings per share growth. I want to see stocks that have grown in earnings. A P-E ratio of 0 to 70. I may even select, because this is a spread position, to avoid stocks that have an earnings date between now and expiration. There we go. So we have a few results here. Eli Lilly, Merck, and Coca-Cola. Yeah, I know. We've been in a, someone mentioned, well, we've been in a downtrend the past uh, day or so. But yeah, I don't think that would throw off. Uh, and Mark says, ditch the, the earnings if you want to. Just the earnings occlusion if you choose it. Yeah. I, I just like to leave it in there because it's a spread, and I'll show you why in a moment. Okay, so... We've got Tyson Foods, LLY, Merck and & Company, and Coca-Cola. The Coca-Cola has some weird strikes. I'm going to keep a simple one here. Not as far out of the money as I'd like, but we'll go ahead and take it. We're going to use the Eli Lilly one going to the 3rd January expiration, which is 28 days. It offers weeklies. That's probably one of the reasons it hindered it. And the September 95 on the 119. 8.3% downside protection. 222 up front against 2690. And the max return is 16.4%. Strange here, but I expect that with the implied volatilities and the implied volatility ratio. All right, so let's just take a look at this one here. And I want to go to the profit and loss chart to help our explanations on some of these. This is going to give me a problem in a second. There we go. Okay, so this one is not that bad. Now, what did we do here? We have a debit of $24.34 on a spread width of $25. Now, we do have a maximum return of 16%, but I need to explain this profit and loss chart, Dan. This is the profit and loss chart at January 3rd expiration, 28 days from now. Based on the theoretical Black-Scholes pricing model of what the long option would be worth, or 2020, was that a 2021 January series? I apologize. No, it's September 2020. So it's based on where that September 90 call would be priced if the stock is trading at these prices. It's a theoretical calculation. It's not a guarantee. But what do we know about this September 90 call? Well, we bought a call several months out in time. So based on the time decay curve, we're not expecting to, you know, here's 90 days, here's 60, here's 30, here's 120. So we're not expecting to lose too much time value, even if the stock remains the same. That's one of the great things about this type of strategy is that 222 out of the money 120 strike on LLY, that 222 is going to start to decay rapidly. But this 90 would retain a lot of its time value until we get into those last 45 days or so. So this peak 
percent return is based on the theoretical value of our 90 call if the stock's trading right at 120 on 3rd January expiration. And why do we see the profits start to dip down? It's not that bad. This dip down from the max doesn't seem that high, and that's why I said it looks pretty good. Why is that happening? Okay. Remember, we searched for deltas that were greater than 0.8 for the long option and keeping a delta ratio of around 1.5. So we might be at about 0.4 or 0.35 here for that 120 strike, probably closer to 0.45. And that's okay. It might be closer to at the money than you like. Now, why the profit dips off after the peak? Unlike a covered call, remember, whereas if I had bought LLY at 119.64 and sold the 120, if it's anywhere above 120, I'm making this 3 or 4% return if I'm assigned. doesn't matter where it goes. The calendar spread is a little different because of the miracle of expiration. Here I have a 90 call that I bought out to September with a delta of 0 0.80. And here my 120 30-day out call that I sold probably has a delta of, let's say, 0.45. Now let's say the stock goes up to 121 the day before Janu on January 2nd, the day before January 3rd expiration. It only moved up a point. My 90 September put might go up to a delta of 0.82, maybe 0.83. You know, it, it's increasing as the stock moves up. And this option might have gained 85 cents for that $1 move up to, let's say, 120.64 or 121. But the delta is creeping up slowly. This short September delta, I'm sorry, this short January delta, my apologies, is now going close to a delta of one if it's in the money or zero. It might actually be at a delta of 0.94 with one day left to expiration, the 120 strike with the stock trading at 121. So what it's telling you is the stock continues to go up, this short option on or near expiration is going faster to a delta of one and your leap option is still lagging. That's why you come off of the full profit. That's an important point. Important point number two that I mentioned, debit of 2434 on a strike difference of 25, my debit to strike difference ratio. Why is that important? Let's say I enter this trade. And next week, LLY gaps up to 130 for some good news, um, early earnings positive report, which we don't often see. But let's just say it jumps up to 130. I get assigned early on my January 3rd, 120 call. We say, hey, no problem. That's why I bought the 90. So yeah, I have an obligation to deliver shares of stock here at 120. I'm sorry, but I bought the 95, isn't it? I apologize, but we bought the 95 call in this case. So that covers it, and you're right. But what's the difference? We get 25 back only. I buy shares of stock at 95. I deliver it at 120. We get 25 back on a cost basis of 24.34. So I make what? 66 cents not 399. Why is there such a difference? Because remember this max return is based on at short-term expiration, you still retain the time value through September. And if this call expired and you sold to close the long option, you'd get both the intrinsic and the time premium. If you get assigned early, you just get intrinsic back. You don't get any time value even if it's still out to September. So that's one of the dangers of referring to this. That's the first subtle danger of the why referring this as a poor man's covered call is dangerous because this is expected on the assumption that the best return occurs and you're in a position to sell to close that farther out option that you had to get both the extrinsic and the intrinsic value. If you get assigned early, the profit is the debit minus the difference in the strike prices, which is why I never want a debit that's greater than the difference in strike prices because I could actually be at a loss even if it was assigned early. So that's a key thing. The second thing here is to remember what we're doing. 
we're using a leveraged option that cost us around $26 and is now roughly, as we mentioned, about 24 points, 25 points in the money right now. But it's a leveraged call. And this is the real reason why I dislike the term poor man's covered call when talking about a diagonal spread. I collect 226 for the 120 at the money call and buying Eli at 119.64. So I'm making about a 1.8% return, right? Or maybe a 1.7% return on the position. That's 226 by 119, okay? All right, now, maybe that's a little bit too high, but in any case, if the stock falls 10%, $11 to 108, I keep that 226, I lose $11 on the position, let's call it 12 down to 107, I lose about $12 on the position, I keep the $2.25 or whatever, so I've lost $10 or about 8% on my cost of 119 or really 117. And that's, let's say, in the first 14 to 15 days, something goes the opposite direction and it falls to 107. You're in a long call now not the stock. If the stock falls to 107, say day before Christmas, in this case, you paid 2660 for the long call, the theoretical value would be 1805. You didn't lose the $10 I lost on the stock, but you lost $629 on an investment of 2400. So you're essentially at a little bit more than a 25% loss, one-fourth. If the stock drops 15%, you might be at a 40% loss on the position. Are you losing as much monetarily? No, but you're falling into the trap of the lie of leverage. Here's what I mean. If I did a covered call in LLY, of course, it would have cost me about $12,000 to buy 100 shares of stock and sell the call for that 1.4, 1.7% return if I'm assigned at 100. The diagonal would have only cost you 2,400, but let's say you had 8,000 to invest, 9,000 to invest, you did four contracts. Now you're falling into the lie of leverage. Do you stand to potentially make much more? Absolutely, but remember, Unlike a covered call where if the stock falls 10% or 15%, you know you've lost 7% or 12% because you generated 3% in premium. Here you're going to be losing 20, 25, and if there's a 15 or 17% drop, you might be at a 50% loss on the long call, even with the delta of 0.8, even deep in the money, even higher than that. So that's what you always have to take into consideration is that Percentage-wise of what you invested, this is still leveraged even with that higher delta, and that can get you into trouble if you don't practice proper position sizing. Okay, so just wanted to uh, make sure all of that's clear. Real quick review, use the same stock criteria that you would consider looking for a quality stock that you're neutral to bullish on, almost the same criteria you'd look for a good covered call, naked put, bull put credit spread. You want good volume quality stocks in an uptrend, whether you're using MACD or SMA. That one thing I just mentioned to you, and uh, Mark was correct, right? We're going into another earnings season soon, 30, 45 days in. So I might be filtering out a lot of stocks right now. But just even though we call this the poor man's covered call and we're using a deep in the money call, it's still a bullish sentiment. And it's a leverage bullish sentiment. So if I hit an earnings and the earnings disappoint and the stock falls 15%, yeah, I still probably have several months I can write against it, but my current position is down 40, 50, 55%. Okay? That's usually when most people would say it's time to get out of the spread, lick your wounds, and try to make it back other ways. Very hard to manage a position that has a 40 or 50% loss. There are ways to do it, but... It's very difficult. So that's sort of the key of why I avoid earnings between now and expiration. I treated my diagonal spreads just like I treat my bull put credit spreads and others.
I want to avoid the earnings between now and expiration because I can't take the surprise on a leveraged position. I don't want to be on the wrong side of a surprise in that situation. You want to be slightly out of the money with your short call. Probably want to keep it under 30 to 45 days out in time on the short. And you can set it up for weeklies as well. Just accept the fact you're going to collect lower premium if you're trying to go week by week against an option that's five, six, eight months out in time, 10 months or more. We want a good delta ratio, 1.5, 1.7. You can look for the long option if you're trying to mimic the poor man, I'm sorry, long, high long option delta if you're trying to mimic the poor man's covered call. If you look for lower delta, say of 0.6, that just means you're not as deep in the money. You don't have as much uh, sort of protection as the stock fluctuates as you do by going deeper in the money. But I also consider it two different approaches. A higher delta on that long for me means I'm planning on doing continuous right cycles where if I buy closer to at the money with that long option that's three, four, five months out in time, that's more of attempting to get a good return, leverage return in 20 to 30 days, having the advantage to go a different, an extra right cycle if I want to, but keeping it shorter term and not looking to continually write the position. Okay, so you'll see a lot more of that information. I know we spent about 35 minutes on it right now. You'll see a lot more of that information again in that webinar section under option strategies and go back to March 15th of 2017. Okay, Dan, so that's my response to what I would look for in a diagonal spread. You'll see a lot more content and how do I want to say this? Probably more coherent discussion on the criteria, not as rushed on that webinar that you can find there as well.